Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cynthia the Audio Bell. I just recently got back from White Bear Lake, Minnesota to visit the motherland of my MagnaPan speakers. I had been planning a trip to MagnaPan since Axpona. The Magnapan boys were eager to get me to come up to the factory since all the pranks I pulled on them to prove to me that Magnapans do really have bass. But that alone would not have been an interesting enough story to share with you guys. My dream was to meet Jim Whiney, the inventor of Magnaplaner technology, and I thought it was very critical that someone capture his personality on camera. No one has done a video interview of Jim before, All of the interviews he has done in the past are posted in written articles, so I was very lucky to be given the opportunity to visit Jim and his wife Karen at their lovely home in St. Paul, Minnesota. And to my surprise, Jim would rate his own speakers a 2 out of 10 compared to the absolute sound. Magnapan is a family of entrepreneurs and inventors. I'm not just talking about blood relatives. From what I learned, a lot of the employees have the bug to invent, create new things, and improve upon existing inventions. For example, Wendell of Marketing likes to invent non-audio related things in his free time. On our trip, he took my husband Jeremy and I out to try out his silent shotgun invention, his shotgun tracers that he sold to Winchester, and a new safety net concept that he came up with. Corey, the shipping manager at Magnapan, likes to DIY his own speakers. Marv, the magnet lane guy, invented a better contraption to help in his everyday job of laying magnets on plates. At one point, Jim Whiney's son Mark held a contest before the LRS was born to let his employees come up with their own design ideas for the LRS to see who had the best one, and just to give the opportunity for creative minds to... Be creative. Jim Whiney, of course, was the inventor of Magnaplaner technology. When I asked him how he came up with the idea, he explained that he happened to be in a bathroom at the time. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cynthia the Audio Bell. I am here with Jim Whiney today. He is the inventor of Magnaplaner technology. Anything that you know that is planar magnetic, be it headphones or speakers. This man is the inventor of said technology, and I'm here with him today um, to talk about Magnapan and some of just random questions that I have for him, things I've always wanted to ask him. He's never been on a video interview before, so I'm happy to present him to you guys over video. What made you think to make a Magnaplaner speaker in the first place? Like, where was your mind when this all came well, about? Well, it, it was a combination of factors. Um, I had uh, working on a project, I worked for 3M at the time, mm-hmm. and I was working on a project that involved uh, some magnetized uh, pieces of... of uh, what did they call it? Uh, uh, the uh, the name for it, I forget. Uh, the name for, for the magnet, 3M magnet material. I forget. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll remember it. But anyway, I was um, working on a project of that and also... Uh, Involved with some uh, people in the uh, electrical uh, division, uh, and um, I was actually sitting in the boys' room mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> when you thought of it. <laughs> and I looked up, and uh, a perforated ceiling tile, uh-huh. and the light bulb went on. Can't tell you exactly <laughs> why, but that's where I. Thought about, I thought about 
transparency, you know, uh, because the sound could pass through it. Mm -hmm. And um, it just it just struck the light bulb went on. I had some magnetic material. The only magnetic material I had was some uh, material extruded by B.F. Goodrich. And it had three zones, north, south, north. So it completed a circuit. And uh, I can tell you, the first thing I did when I got the idea, I had a, always wished I had kept this. Should have been in our archives, but I found somehow lost it. But doors come at a certain length, and then they cut them off mm -hmm. to uh, whatever size they want. Well, I I took one of those doors, and I had this this strip of of uh, uh, B.F. Goodrich material, which had three zones in north, south, north, and I took two pencils for frets, and I run a piece of tape across, tied down at one end, down the other end, and uh, and then tied them down so the, the adhesive side was up. Mm -hmm. uh, I took, I had some fine, very fine aluminum, or which was copper wire to start with, and I that was enough to make a a circuit so that if you ran a current through it, it it, it was a loudspeaker. Well, it wasn't very loud, <laughs> but yeah, I heard it. Oh, what did it sound like? It, it was puny, <laughs> but I was blown away by it. In fact, I had my dear wife come down in the basement at 3 o'clock in the morning. and uh, What did she think? <laughs> She always gave me support. I was very fortunate in that. In fact, she finished getting me through college. I ran out of the GI Bill. Aww. She never lets me forget it, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, anyway, that that's what started it. And uh, I played around with it for literally a, a few years, mm -hmm. still working for 3M. And um, I reached a point where I had put together, and you you have pictures of the that original. Uh, Two sections in a pen. Yeah. Yes. She has photographs. Of that. You probably have yeah, photographs. Yeah, you sent me a photograph. Okay. Well, that was not the first one. The first one I actually put together was not strips of magnets. Mm -hmm. It was sheets, and I had this guy build a die for me, and a little. little uh, I think they were about a sixteenth inch diameter pins, and in in a sheets, those sheets were that wide and about that long, mm -hmm. and that's what I built the first speakers out of, and that's the first speakers that Bill Johnson heard. I took them over to his place, and. Uh, I don't know whether you know who he was. He audio was research. Audio research. And um, took it over there, and um, he was very impressed. He he wanted to do something together. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, But we had a problem. It was extremely directive, which I knew. In other words, I don't you know enough about acoustics, but you got a driver, the wider it gets, the more it beams. They have a very small wire. It, 
it disperses very well. Right, right. And I knew it. Bill knew it. He picked up on it right away. Well, I had already acquired a, a, a crossover. I knew I need to put a narrow unit together that would have good dispersion. And um, I, I started on that. I'm trying to remember how things went with Bill. Uh, I had a marketing agreement with him, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I had a marketing agreement. Uh, it, but it only included the folding screen model. Right. Have you seen pictures of that? Three panels hinged together. Like uh, a dressing screen, like the Tiffany's, or yeah, yeah, that Tiffany. It only included that because I already was working on a single panel mm -hmm. unit, the MG2, the original MG2, and um, and that had the the narrow uh, ribbon along one edge, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it went through a number of iterations. <laughs> the true ribbon? Uh, no, no, no. No, that didn't come along. Uh, the true ribbon. It, uh, it, it was in, the first speaker it was in was a timpani four. Okay. That's why uh, everybody likes the timpani fours so much. Pardon? Is that why everybody likes the timpani fours so much? <laughs> I don't know. It was kind of expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but it had bass. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. But uh, Bill had his problems. Airplanes. <laughs> was his problem, right, Wendell? <laughs> yeah, so what was this deal about an airplane? Like, he bought Wendell an airplane? Yeah. Yeah, but so Wendell didn't sell, care for it. Sell speakers <laughs> <laughs> or sell equipment. No. Yeah. So, were you into high-end audio before you made the speaker, or had the idea? Like, did were you an audiophile or? Uh, no, I, I was more into photography before. Okay. But um, the audiophile thing, uh, it got me started. I was in college. My wife had a console, a TV, and it had a two-speaker system in it mm -hmm. with a crossover. And that's, I, I got a Gerard turntable and a, um, I forget the cartridge, and uh, hooked that all up and had a pretty darn good sounding system. And, and that's when I got hooked, making improvements. Uh, oh, wow. It was fun. You're tinkering with it? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I tinkered with it a lot. And it, and it, I had it to a pretty good point. Quite a few of the people that work at MagnaPan took a pay cut from another job to be there. Corey, the shipping manager, and Mick, the service manager, are young and have every opportunity to work a cozy desk job. Ken, the production manager, also took a pay cut to come work at MagnaPan. Marv has been working there for 20 plus years and loves his job. All of these people believe in the product so much that they are willing to make personal sacrifices to continue to see it succeed. Even Jim left a good job at 3M to follow his dream and start the company. And I resigned from 3M. I raised money from friends and relatives to start MagnaPan, mm -hmm. which was 1956. How old were you then? How the old time? was I then? At the time? 
20s or? Yeah, yeah. I raised a whole $1,600. $1,600. So I was working for 3M at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got into the audio stuff. I ended up buying KLH-9s from Bill. And... Jansen? The Jansen KLH-9s? Yes, yes. So you bought the KLH-9s from, from Bill. Yeah. Did you buy his amplifier? Yes, I had his... I had to wait for him. He was waiting for the patent to come through on his, clo what do you call it? Cross-coupled. Cl yeah, cross-coupled circuitry. Yeah. And he wouldn't let me have them until. <laughs> he wouldn't let <laughs> so you So I had the first pair. And uh, of course they, uh, they needed, magnaplaners needed more power than that. Jim started Magnapan as a young entrepreneur in his 20s. I thought it would be great to ask what his advice and wisdom would be for other young people that want to invent and be entrepreneurs. I was curious about whether anyone had shut down his ideas or told him that his technology just wouldn't work. So you were, you were in your 20s when all of this started coming about. You were really young at the time. Yeah. A lot of what I'm seeing with with young people is they have a lot of bright ideas and things that they want to do but but they're young and so they're inexperienced you were young when you came up with this idea you're an entrepreneur a really great entrepreneur you had a vision and it came about and then you created a loudspeaker was there anybody in your life that just thought it was the dumbest idea ever and didn't care for it at the time yeah, there was a, uh, what was his name? Worked for 3M. He was a doctor. Doctor, in, I know, not a medical doctor, but he was a right. doctor. <laughs> yeah, he said it can't work. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> what kind of advice, or what's one piece of advice you would give to young people in the same boat as you were that are wanting to build something or be an entrepreneur and, and make it in that world? <laughs> <laughs> well, you better be creative. Mm -hmm. That was probably number one. And I'm very creative. There's no doubt about Obviously. that. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, I am very creative. Uh, and I don't know, how do you get that? Uh, I grew up on the farm, on and around the farm, and different things I did. Uh, you had to be creative. I mean... It, you something broke down on the farm, you, you fixed it yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like nobody's yeah. there to help fix it for you. You yeah. have to do it yourself. You couldn't afford to pay somebody to come out, and, especially in the family hives, because they were all. My grandfather, Grandpa Whiny, Albert Whiny, fourth grade education, he was a mechanical genius. He really was. I mean, you just wouldn't believe the stuff that guy did. You know, he a, his own generator says that was before they even had REA. What's that? Rural Electrification okay. Program. They brought in after the war, after the Second World War. And, but he had his own generator. I remember a big wall of these big rows of lead batteries. <laughs> <laughs> and all the things he did. You know, he built his own 
we uh, always raised uh, cattle. Mm -hmm. Had that we had our own herd, and uh, so we had like twenty five to thirty babies every year <laughs> to to uh, uh, to deal with, and. Uh, He he built. Oh, we always uh, fed them chopped. Hey, we had a chopper that chopped alfalfa, broom, all the different kinds. Okay. And uh, he put a track. He put a he put a thing together. A, a big trailer. You might. It was on wheels. It wasn't a. You had to pull it around with a with another tractor, but it had a movable gate, and then you you go through your field and you chop and you blow it into this. Well, you got to get it out of there to get it into the silo. We used silo pits. We used ground pits. We didn't use the tall things. And he put the darndest thing together to. To do that, and uh, it just—he he was a mechanical genius, and he even went—he even went for—he did go for a patent. Uh, one of the problems during that period of time was the corn bore. A corn bore was a real big problem, and they would chew into the stalk and. Uh, Corn would fall over. Mm -hmm. So he invented this. Now, a normal corn picker is a snout that just goes down the road. Well, he came up with the idea of making this a spiral thing so that it would feed it more freely back mm -hmm. into the, the area where the where it went to before they oh, that is creative. did whatever they chopped it. We always chopped it. Yeah, he was. But that's, I don't, that's something you're born with. Something you that can't learn actually. being creative, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think you can either. I, I couldn't learn how to paint. I try, but I'm not good at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So creativity, they have to have creativity, but any any advice you'd give them on like the process or or just encouragement <laughs> or anything like that? Overcoming obstacles. Yeah. Any obstacles. What 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 prompted me to I can't say anybody said do it. I'm the only one that said do it. You had to have the drive, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't think there's any way you can quantify it at all. <laughs> okay. You either have it or you don't. I would right say that's pretty well said. Jim's vision of what a magnaplanar speaker should be able to reproduce is not limited to a female vocalist and a string instrument. His intention was to ensure his speakers could reproduce an 80-instrument orchestra in your room. If you think about it, that is a much larger feat than it would be to merely reproduce Diana Krall's voice, or for the younger folk out there, electronic dance music. I wanted to know how close he felt he came to his vision. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, I was talking to Wendell about your vision of what the speaker should sound like, and he always tells me that your vision of what the magna planner should reproduce uh, is equivalent to the sound from the 11th row at Minnesota Orchestra Hall. So my question for my you... My seat. <laughs> your, your special seat. My question for you is, do you think that's where the future of these speakers should be, or do you think that... There should be some type of adaptation and change for newer music. 
They're not efficient. They're very inefficient. Mm -hmm. They take a lot of power. And they don't do well in commercial applications. I don't know of... Oh, somebody did do a big... Who was that did that? Kind of a ring of thing. Gabriel? Yeah. Yeah. He had the Whatever the happened stage. to Gabriel? Uh, he's still working on it. He's, getting, he's applied for the patent. Actually... The first speaker, first thing I ever did with a speaker was to cut a hole in a cardboard box and I mounted a conventional speaker in it. <laughs> uh, I was pretty young when I did that. I was pretty darn young. Would have been in my teens. So, Jim, when, when you come back from Orchestra Hall and listen to the Magnaplaners, how did you feel? Well, it was certainly uh, something to have a goal to, but it was nothing, nothing compared to Orchestra Hall. Okay. Especially the way they... They did that was very diffuse sound. It was good. It was very good. And I, uh, oh, I had uh, a lot of friends over there. Oh, one of my favorite people uh, just loved my speakers. Isaac Stern, the great violinist. He had had them in uh, and his pad in New York mm -hmm. and uh, he had them like yeah, I never saw it but he described it of course this was the folding screen model the timpanis yeah oh yeah Isaac that's cool. Though that has to be, uh, it has to feel good that somebody is using your speakers and one of your Oh, friends. yeah. Well, yeah, a lot of them did. Um, uh, Isak Perlman, uh, he used them at a, t uh, at a time, but uh, he didn't stay with it. Willie Nelson had timpani. Oh yeah, Willie. Willie. Nelson yeah. Had oh Willie. <laughs> what? How did that happen? <laughs> How did that happen? You met him somewhere. Uh... Where did where did I originally meet Willie? Well, we were invited out to New Jersey to the Wind Brothers. Yeah, we we were invited out to the grand opening, uh, but it was before that. Where did I meet him before that? Oh, that yeah, Kenny Wynn. Yeah, that's what that's where I met with Kenny Wynn, Wynn, uh, the big uh, Caesars or Golden Nugget. Golden Nugget. Yeah. And uh, never paid for any bills at the Golden <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Wynn, and this is one of the beautiful suites in the Golden Nugget of Las Vegas, which, as everybody knows, is downtown. Nevertheless, you'd be amazed if you knew how many people think that this is uptown. Hi, Mr. Sinatra. I'm Steve Wynn. I run this place. You see, I get enough towels. Yeah, Kenny, you know, he really liked our speakers. And he had them. He took us to his home one time. <laughs> He's got original Warhol paintings, Warhol paintings hanging around. Wow. And, uh, yeah. 
Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of The Absolute Sound. We have a new product. It's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack, first of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks, and now back to the show. After returning from a performance at Minnesota Orchestra Hall, Jim listened to his speakers and realized they were not even close to accurately reproducing an orchestra. That's when he got to work on his invention of a true ribbon tweeter. How close did you come to recreating orchestra halls? Did the speakers compare with orchestra hall? Or? I would say it didn't come close. Oh, <laughs> well, how close did it okay, come? Well, give it a number. What number would you give? Two. A, what? <laughs> did that? Well, did that incite you to do anything else with them after that, or did you just continue making improvements at that point? Well, I guess I never quit on that. Uh, but probably uh, one of the biggest things I did was uh, coming up with the uh, ribbon tweeter, the true true ribbon tweeter, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that because that, that was the that. weak part of our system was okay. was the high end and uh, Winlow and I had been out to New York and come back and we had kind of discussed it and I I come back and I I had where did I have this aluminum foil I happen to have, I guess I caught it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, anyway, uh, I had a piece about two foot long. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I would have, to use that, I would have had to use a, a uh, transformer. And there's no way I'm going to use a transformer. So I took it. And I took some caustic soda, mm -hmm. which, and I dipped that down in that, and I had a, an ohm meter on it, and when it got to, I don't know, four ohms, I guess, then I took it out, because <laughs> I could direct drive it then, you did not a use it. And uh, that's what I made the first one that worked. Wow. But of course, it was only that long. And and you didn't have a very, you couldn't hardly be standing up and sitting down. But, you know, then all the work I did then to make that uh, full range, mm -hmm. like the rest of the speaker. Well, and then, Jim, because of that tweeter, uh, now when, I, when Colleen and I sit in your seat for row 11, I, I think the magnet planers now are a three out of ten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so far okay. to go. Well, what, uh, yeah, yeah. What, what did you think after you changed to using the ribbon tweeter? Did you think it was a three out of ten after that? Or? Uh, oh, I never looked at it that way. <laughs> okay. I, I don't remember pegging and those kind of numbers. Well, I remember you commenting. Uh, coming home, how it, it was li uh, like how far we have to go until we can recreate the actual orchestra. Yeah. It was a huge challenge. The thought is that if you can reproduce an orchestra, everything else should fall into place. But my question marks with Maggie's have circled around the bass. Younger people have to have bass because they did not grow up in an era where recordings lacked it. And I wanted to know Jim's thoughts on the future of Magnapan and whether he thought the company should be flexible to change in musical interests and genres to continue to thrive. So why is it such a challenge recreating an orchestra over other instruments or types of music? 
what is it about an orchestra that's so difficult versus anything else? Just the fact they have a whole bunch of instruments and and whatnot, or? Well, there's lots of different kind of music. There's a lot of music besides orchestral music. You know, no. it's, and, uh, well, there's seventy. There's something called rock, right? Which I <laughs> hate. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, there's seventy or eighty musicians in a large hall. Yeah. Versus one trumpet. Yeah. Or yeah. somebody with a guitar. Yeah. So it's more difficult to recreate an orchestra because of all of the different instruments and then if they have, I'm assuming, choir singers and things versus yeah. just a girl singing and playing acoustic guitar. Yeah. Well, there, there's people who do, uh, I'd say, find success in many different ways. Uh, piano and guitars and violins and uh, bongo drums. I wanted to get some bongo <laughs> drums, but she wouldn't let me. What do, what do you think about young people's music today? If I saw that face. <laughs> <laughs> What is young people's music today? Does it sound like a subwoofer? <laughs> <laughs> Wendell says the only thing that sounds like a subwoofer is a subwoofer. And a lot of the people my age like stuff that has a whole bunch of bass and is nothing but bass, and they don't really oh. appreciate orchestral music. Well, those people have never been our customers, of course, mm -hmm. unless they put a subwoofer on it and used a crossover, and then Wendell designed it. How's that thing doing? Uh, which? Uh, that that. Um, the woofer. That woofer, you. Well, it's, it's, uh, we're we're trying to get it on the market. We, it, we think it's going to be this uh, this year. Okay. The dipole woofer. Yeah. Do you go back to the sweet sixteen days? Well, it it has some similarity. Yes. Yeah. Yes, when, I do. when you told me about it, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Yeah. A sweet 16. Yeah. You got a big plywood panel here, and you had 16 speakers. Mm -hmm. I don't know who was who will take credit for this at sweet 16. But anyway, this guy, whoever he was, I, I'm sure you could find out. Um, some of the speakers faced one way and the others faced, faced the other way. And somehow, in fact, McNamara is here somewhere. I mean, he might be dead now. He built one of those. Are they like dipole woofers as well? Kind of similar to what Wendell's got? No, was, no. Wrong. This All it was was just a sheet of plywood, and this guy, whoever decided to do this, come up with a placement and polarity. Mm -hmm. Some of them were pushing one way while the others were going the other way. And somehow... That's cool. It sounds like one hell of a mathematical... But yeah. I'm sure. You must have been a genius. So have you got to hear Wendell's woofers yet? Have you got to hear the dipole woofers? Uh, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. Okay. Well, I was just I was just kind of wondering because a lot of uh, what his the um, the woofer invention, the dipole woofers, and my husband Jeremy and I getting into whether we like a subwoofer or not, how to get clean bass without making it too much. Uh, kind of sent me into this base kick of understanding it better. But typically, people our age like electronic music, stuff that's generated by computers, stuff that's not technically real. And I was wondering if, do you foresee that uh, MagnaPan will have to adapt 
to like the newer generation's music over time to stay alive or yeah. what do either. you think? Ask him. <laughs> well, I know what he's going to tell me. He's going to say only a subwoofer sounds like a subwoofer. So. He's the marketing man. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, there are some there are some decent subwoofers. Mm -hmm. well, Rel makes some good ones, don't yeah. they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody always tells me that. I haven't heard yeah, of Yeah, there are some decent subwoofers. And for those that have got to have it, uh, that's the way to go. Either that or you put it in the wall. You know, one of the best sounding systems I ever heard was those we put in the wall in Kinsvater's basement. So the back wave couldn't get, I mean, there was a big part of the basement back here, and it was in a wall, so it didn't cancel, cancel out. It. And I tell you, that system sounded good. Corey, Corey was telling me, um, the young man that works as the shipping manager at Magnapan, Corey, yeah. he was telling me that you had experimented with some infinite baffle stuff in the walls. Uh, infinite baffle. Mounting the speaker to the wall and letting them breathe into the, the Well, wall that's space. what I'm describing. Is yeah. That's the way that was. And it was good. That's really interesting. It was I don't really think I've ever heard anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. I found out that Jim hasn't really heard any of the current models of Maggie's. So, so you haven't heard the woofers. Have you heard any of the, the current models, like the 1.7Is, 3.7Is, LRS Plus or anything yet? I, you, no. No? I haven't heard anything lately. I have a pair of 1.7s in Florida. Mm -hmm. so, so when did you retire? I guess I didn't I never. When did I retire? I didn't know when you retired and when kind of Mark when started taking over. When did I retire? Over. Officially, I did retire quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. When did I retire? When? <laughs> when did Mark take it over? About it's been a little over twenty years. Twenty years. Did you still give some feedback on speakers for a while after retiring? Or were you like Wendell where you never retired for a bit? <laughs> no. Because he's a workaholic. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, well, I meant I'm interested. I, I was very interested in that big, how many panels? Four p. 30.7. Yeah, yeah. thirty point seven. How many do you, of those do you end up selling? Uh, some. Some. While Jim's largest accomplishment is his invention of magnaplanar technology, that is not the only invention he has claimed as his own. I still don't sleep a lot. <laughs> do you still have creative ideas about just random things? No. Like an engineer? No. <laughs> what about your napkin invention? Oh. <laughs> My nap. You got a napkin laying around, okay? Yeah, I have a lot of patents. Was the speaker your first invention, or you had other inventions before that? No, the first invention, and probably the biggest mistake I made in my life, not going to one of the game people. It was a game board. A, a, it played best with three players. Uh-huh. And a very simple a metal board, sheet, uh, sheet metal, and a round board, and each of you set, and you had a, um, okay, it's metal. You got a rubber band going from this metal magnet. It's, a, it's a, like a permanent magnet. Mm. Uh, uh, 
And each, each, and I, I use, I just used clothespins, didn't I? Yeah. It's, it's in the archives in Magnapan. I'm sure it's up there. Uh, and so three players played the best. You could play it with two, but three was best. So you had this metal board, you had this magnet, and you stretched your, each of you stretched your, uh, your rubber band and fastened it to, and I had it, I had it fixed so that, and then they had a time delay relay, simple little electronic device mm -hmm. that, uh, when the light went on, you did this, and. Uh, I made. I found that if I did two of them, it was impossible for anybody to cheat. But anyway, that was the first one. I got a patent on that, and uh, I should have gone to one of the game. Now this was before electronics. It would it would have been done away with eventually by an electronic device, which they do have. By Is the it way. The at yeah. the arcades now where you push the button to stop the light or yeah I, i'm sure they have them and i believe it's in a last i knew it was in a cardboard box up in the archives at magnapan oh, your, your napkin, uh... oh the napkin okay what it, what it was uh in addition to what you see here there was a keyhole punched in this. Okay. A buttonhole. Uh-huh. All right. If you had a button, oh. you could put it on the button. If you didn't have a button, you peeled the liner off. And just stick it on. And just stick it on. That's so cool. And, and I got a... Because the napkins were bigger. And I got a patent on that. Oh yeah, there you go. It's, just, it's bigger yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. That's this was little things but, like that to improve okay. your quality of life. <laughs> so, uh, but what happened there? Uh, I had applied for the patent, and it was refused. It was turned down. My patent attorney. A darn good one said, Jim, they should not have turned that down. And I'll tell you, I'll make you a deal. I will appeal it. If I win, you owe me $3,000. If I don't, you don't owe me anything. <laughs> we won. Wow. He won. Took five years. That's how long an That's appeal crazy. on a patent takes. Five years. Yeah, well, Wendell was telling me all about patents and how it could take a while to actually get the patent approved and just all the craziness you can go through. I had no idea. I got showcased at uh, on National Inventors Day. Oh. Oh, and I got some awards. Oh, yeah. yeah, where's my IR-100? My IR yeah. Speakers were on display. Yeah, they were on display wow. for a whole year Damn. at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Really? And, and, and the other guy that was, was there, too, and got one was... The Kodak, Kodak uh, Cameron, the fast. Oh, the Instamatic or the Polaroid. Polaroid? Polaroid. Yes. Camera. Yeah. He got one too the same year. The guy who invented the Polaroid? Polaroid, yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. Wow. That's so cool. You know, the LaChoy, Chung King, Chung King. There's, I don't know, three or four that have the 
two can system mm -hmm. of chow mein. Yeah, we have those at the house. Okay, 13 and a half inches for a piece of tape mm -hmm. to go around that. I did the conceptual design, and, and it was three, six girls were sitting there at a desk spinning these things, get the tape, spin it, cut it. I, I did the conceptual design to do 200 sets of those a minute. What? I was also wondering if Jim had critics ears when he got into building his speakers. Um, I wanted to I wanted to circle back to the topic of audio and ask you kind of a fun question, Jim. Oh, okay. So Wendell's always telling me that he has critics ears, but he can't listen to music anymore because he's always criticizing it. And I was wondering if after you started getting into listening to high-end speakers that you made, did you start getting to the point where you couldn't enjoy the music anymore? Or I love my listening with my planar magnetic headphones. Headphones? Same principle as the speakers. And that's a big <laughs> mistake MagnaPan made. You know what it, these guys are getting for these planar <laughs> magnetic <laughs> headphones? <laughs> I mean, two, three thousand bucks. <laughs> of course, MagnaPan would do their normal thing. They'd give them away. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I listen to, uh, yeah, music, YouTube music. Mm -hmm. I have a rather large collection of uh, DSD. Mm -hmm. Direct stream digital. Okay. So I listen to the, those stuff, mm -hmm. um, and I, I use a DAC, so it's really good. Sometimes I take the hearing aids out when I do that. But, you know, I found out that those hearing aids are doing their job. Because <laughs> when I take them out, I'm losing the highs. See, my, about 3K, it goes like oh, that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> do you enjoy the music, or do you just criticize it in your head when you listen to oh, it? Oh, I enjoy music. I enjoy music. I enjoy orchestral music. and. Uh, does it bug you when it sounds bad? Like, if, if the orchestra doesn't sound up to par, does it bother you? I don't think... Um, that kind of a critic. Okay. I was just curious because Wendell says that he has gotten to the point where he can't, he has to listen to his car radio to enjoy music now. No. <laughs> now we did, we changed our seat. That 11th row seat that we had, it was off to the left and farther back. Oh no. <laughs> it was horrible sound. Yeah, you never enjoyed it. So that. yes. Okay, is the so answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> Do I think about how good it sounds? When it sounds bad, you when recognize When they ch <laughs> changed us, it sounded terrible. My final question, though, and the most important I had, was if Jim had accomplished everything that he wanted to with MagnaPan. Okay, okay, so serious question. Did you accomplish everything that you wanted to with MagnaPan? Yes. Except headphones. <laughs> well, anyway, it never went in. I didn't. Always wished I had. The only regret is headphones. No, I, 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 I love to listen to headphones. Okay. I, I, uh, <laughs> I watch, I listen to TV mm -hmm. with headphones. I have a system for and the sound is awesome. It really is. Do you like headphones better? Oh, by far. Wow. As com these don't re reproduce any bass. <laughs> so you like bass? Well, I want some. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Cynthia the Audio Bell, Jim Whiney.
inventor of the magnaplanar speaker. Thank you for letting okay. me talk to you. Well, thank you very much. For, I'm pleased with what you're doing. All right, so today we have our order of Ellers Plus to a few lucky people. We have Julio out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He'll be getting one. Probably by the time you guys post this, he'll already be enjoying it, hopefully. You got Jeff out of Milford, Iowa. Scott from Staten Island, New York. Julio from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Don from Isle of Palm, South Carolina. Chris from Chapel, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Paul out of Bainbridge, Washington, Bainbridge Island. Constance from Hookset, New Hampshire. Scott out of Valencia, California. Dean out of Spokane, Washington. And last but not least, Raymundo out of Miami, Florida. Very jealous, I would love to be in Miami right now. So hopefully you guys will enjoy these LRS Plus. Just as a little bonus for you guys, after the interview I did previously with MagnaPan Mick, the MagnaPan boys wanted me to hear that MagnaPans do have bass. So they took me to their testing room to hear the 20.7 i's in a controlled environment. And I have to say for Maggie's, they do have bass. About 90 hertz is where Mick recommended a crossover to a sub, but I was able to hear them down to 18, which was rather impressive. However, to get strong bass out of dipoles, they have to be able to pressurize the air. For MagnaPan speakers, the more space in a room you have, the larger the panels need to be to pressurize the room. Thank you again for watching this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. This is the Audio Bell signing out.